Hey everyone, due to request, I'm going to show the After Effects steps that I put into the beam effect from my Clan War video. Now, some of this used some inspiration from the sci-fi weapon effects tutorial on Video Copilot, but some, most of the other stuff was done by me. Now, I'm going to be going over the first shot of the Hadoken in this part of the tutorial. The second shot isn't very different. The only thing that's different is I did some masking to duplicate myself and I added like smoke and sparks on the second guy. This tutorial does use a couple of third-party plugins such as Action Essentials 2 from Video Copilot and the Optical Flares plugin from Video Copilot. Now these aren't essential and you can recreate some of these with After Effects itself like creating some sparks that I use with a particle effect or creating some smoke with fractal noise. But, personally I just prefer to use these, because I have them. Now, going into After Effects here, this is not the full clip, but because I'm not going to show you the energy ball build up, because it's going to take way too long. Essentially what I did was, I, ha I already have this uh, pre-comp with some of uh, a little particle effect. This is m most of most editing in a nutshell, lots and lots of particle effects. So essentially I tracked that in, add a bit of lighting and some particle effects. And um, yeah. So here's the base footage, here's where this imaginary energy ball would be, and here's the Hadoken itself. My friend did some great, great handheld work, must say. So I'm gonna essentially try to recreate what I did earlier as best as I possibly can. So as with any project, I love tracking my footage. I can't remember if I used Mocha for this or not. Um, Mocha comes with After Effects Creative Cloud and I think previous versions. I'm gonna use it because it's a good tracking tool. So, I'm going to open up Mocha. So, in this case, I actually would like to track backwards because in the beginning my hand isn't in the kind of shape that I want it to be in by the end. So, since I'm not the best at tracking in Mocha, I'm just going to do my best job at just splining around my hand. Now, this can be done in After Effects built-in tracker as well, I just prefer to use Mocha because it's more accurate. Trackwards, which is a combination of track and backwards. And if I, it gets screwed up, I can always fix it up later. Okay, it's good enough. For tracking data, um, copy to clipboard, go to After Effects, get your null ready, press paste. And um, so now we have a null object following my hand. Um, don't worry about the, uh, the scale or any of that. And um, the actual effect isn't going to start till right here. And luckily the track is correct at this point in the clip, so it won't matter. I like um, making a cut in the clip as well, just so I know that this footage doesn't matter. So a lot of steps go into this. I believe uh, the things that I'm going to be putting into this are, from the top, a lens flare, um, a smoke puff, some sparks, distortion, a couple of shockwave assets, which are not from the shockwave pack, just some video co-pilot like, showed you a tutorial on how to make shockwave assets, and then they just played a couple of them. So I just recorded my screen because I have no money. So anyways, uh, so there's lens flare, distortion, a shockwave, sparks coming out, a beam effect, um, and lighting. I think that's it. I could, I, there could be more, but um, what to start with? So many options. Um, lighting is probably the hardest part because it will require a bit of rotoscoping. So what I normally like to do for lighting is create a new white solid. I'm actually gonna keep the null. Keep the null, keep the null right there. So make a white solid. I'm gonna call it lighting mat because I believe in organization. Duplicate my base footage, call it lighting. What I would normally do is set the blending mode to add and then tint it the color of whatever is happening in the scene. So I would tint it blue since my Hadoken is blue. Maybe turn down the amount a bit so it isn't completely blue. 85 seems good. And, um, and then we're just gonna hide that. I'm gonna hide that. The lighting mat, um, I'm gonna set the opacity to zero, get my handy dandy masky tool out. Get out my masking tool. This is not going to be very accurate because, like I said before, um, rotoscoping is awful. I didn't actually say that, but it's implied because I hate rotoscoping, it's the most annoying thing. Normally what I would do is I would make I would make a rough outline of myself, and after which I would just feather it a lot, but then it's inaccurate because it bleeds onto the uh, 
onto the background, and that makes no sense. So what I'm gonna do instead, what I normally would do now is roto myself as accurately as I possibly can, and then make a subtractive inverted mat like a circle, right? Okay, let me let me explain what this means. So anything that's white is going to be affected by the lighting. What I will do is I will feather this like 15, grab my ellipse tool, make an elliptical mask, say it's coming from there, so that's about where it would be. Set this to subtract inverted, and now I can feather this all I want like a glow, but it will stay within the bounds of me and not seep onto the background. Normally I would do that, but for the sake of this tutorial, I'm just gonna do a rough roto job. I parent this white solid to the null so it follows the scene, and because of all the stupid rotation stuff, I'm gonna have to reposition the mask by keyframing its mask path. So now that your footage is all rotoed, presumably you did it well, um, find a point where you're getting that issue where it's getting cut off. Get your handy dandy ellipse tool, go like that, subtract, inverted, feather, done. Now you may want to feather this a fair bit more, and um, keep in mind this is a really quick roto job, I'm just trying to keep it within the bounds of this tutorial. In reality you would probably do a way better job rotoscoping than I would. So now that we have our tinted layer, we're going to make that an alpha mat of the white solid, which basically takes the alpha channel of my lighting mat here and um, uses it as a, a mat for this layer. Um, so yeah, there's that. There's your lighting. Um, considering uh, my Hadoken is fairly flickery, what I'm going to do is... Let me just fix up the rotor real quick. Since my um, Hadoken is fairly flickery, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the opacity flicker around by using expression. So, opacity of your lighting layer. I'll click on the stopwatch to add an expression and that type. I'm going to go with wiggle. 15 times a second by a value of 20. That should flicker the opacity a fair bit. Okay, let me turn on the overall opacity. And I'll have more room to flicker. Yeah, that's good enough for me. Now this is, again, you can probably put more effort into these steps, I'm just doing them quickly to keep them in the bounds of a tutorial. So next step, um, I've, I've been working on this separate video with effects very similar. So the next thing I'm going to do is my shockwave. Um, you can just go to videocopilot.net and find their shockwave tutorial. Record one of the uh, shot, any of the shockwaves that come on screen. I'm going to go with this first one because I like the way it looks. Um, and keep in mind, uh, whatever frame rate you're using either should match up to or... Well, it should match up to um, the frame rate that your camera is going at. But uh, if it's not... What you can do is you can go down here to the frame blending options and tick it twice, which turns on a good frame blending technique, or a good frame blending type called pixel motion. So now, since this is at 60 FPS, right now it is blending with my footage fairly well, except there's a couple of frame skips every once in a while. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to speed it up to around 75. Now basically, when, if you're having issues, it will be when you see two frames repeat themselves. So if you see a frame happen, then that same frame happens the next one. As you can see, it, I think it happened a little bit there. So I'm going to speed it up even more. So there's that. Now to make this background get keyed out, I'm going to set this layer to screen. And I would uh, desaturate it and use the VC color vibrance effect to tint it to my liking, except this is already blue. That's exactly what I wanted. So, um, what next? I'm gonna parent that to the null, and instead of actually parenting the whole thing to the null, because I know it's gonna screw with its um, scale and things like that, or wait, maybe not. Okay, never mind. it will be parented to the null. Um, I'm actually gonna scale it up a fair bit. There we go. Big shockwave. Now, one thing you might wanna do is add a bit of a glow in case you think it's not punchy enough. Bring up the radius of a large amount because otherwise it's not going to look at all realistic. 
so there's your shockwave. Um, now, the most important part about this effect is the beam, and I've kind of forgotten a step here. Um, this is also borrowing from Andrew Kramer's sci-fi weapons tutorial. That was 2000 by 2000 or whatever. So, um, this is sort of a technique with a lot of different effects um, that can make a sort of futuristic looking muzzle flash. So now that you watch Andrew Kramer do this, um, should have a cool looking sci-fi type muzzle flash. I added a bit of glow. I'm not sure he does that in the tutorial, but I know for a fact that I do that in this tutorial. So that looks like a cool looking thing. I'm gonna actually scale this up a fair bit and uh, do the rest of the steps that go on in Andrew Kramer's thing. So now that now that I have these shot these little flashes in, I've got a small one, a fairly large one, and then one that flies. Wait, did I use that in the actual thing? I guess I'll never know. So anyway, now that you got your flashes there, um, I think the next step is to add the actual Hadoken, the beam. So I'm gonna hide some of these because I don't want to see them because they're gonna slow down my computer. Make a solid, doesn't matter what color it is, and search for the beam effect. Now, normally what I would do for a beam is something incredibly stupid and unrealistic. I would take a white solid, mask whatever beam effect would happen, put it where I want it, go frame by frame to keyframe those dumb mask points, feather it a bit, Duplicate, duplicate the solid, and make this lower one the color that I want. Feather that a bunch. Done. It's a terrible Hadoken. So what I'm going to do instead is use this awesome After Effects effect called Beam. Now this generates, like you, you can hear, a beam. I'm going to make the length 100 so it fits with the points. And to make this 3D, I can set the starting and ending thickness to different amounts. Wait, start and end points. Okay, here's the start. Shouldn't be as thick. Here's the end, which should be pretty thick. This is going right past the camera. Now I'm going to make this white, these colors, so they match my Hadoken, which I want to be blue. Um, what else do I do? I think I added a big old glow on it because I like adding glows to things. Kind of makes it look like crap now, but if I bring up my radius, it looks better. Now it still doesn't really look all that great in my opinion. The edges aren't that soft. Of course I can fix that. Now that made it look worse. Okay, what I did was I changed the blending mode to add. Now this kind of just makes it look really bright, but it sort of takes away, it sort of like doesn't it makes it not have that sort of crappy sort of look that I was noticing earlier. So, next thing I'm going to want to do is set a keyframe for the time. So it sort of blasts in over a frame or two. And I'll set that first frame as well. So now what you're going to want to do is, remember that tracking data we have? Well, what you're going to do is, to make it follow it, you're going to open the parameter for the position on this null. Take your beam, which I'm going to call beam, actually. Go to the starting point, which you should have, you should know which is which, it's important. And take the pick whip icon, drag it down to the position. Doing this will say, this starting point has to be on the position of this null. So now it's going to follow your shot throughout the scene. Now, considering my camera moves, you might want to make your the other point on the flare move accordingly. Just set a keyframe there. Something like that should look correct. So that's that. And if you already have it parented to the thing, then you're going to want to make a cut here. Unparent it, and then just move it. So. Move the solid, move the beam. So that's that. Flies out, follows the shot, everything's cool. So there's the beam. I'm gonna hide those layers now I'm done with them. And just basically, just to keep my computer going fast, I don't need them. So now I'm gonna start using some stuff from Action Essentials 2. These are some welding sparks. That um, is a fairly, it's a fair, this one is a fairly long clip, so it will be able to last throughout the, uh, the scene. Action Essentials 2 is also in 24 frames per second, and my camera shoots 30, 
So I'm gonna turn on pixel motion to make it be 30. It's not actually 30, but it's still 24 frames per second, but it looks like it's 30. Movie magic at work. So I'm gonna scale it up. I'm actually, since um, the welder here um, makes this sort of big area that I don't really like, I'm going to draw a mask around it. Go and subtract it and feather it a bit. So now I get my color vibrance effect again because the sparks should be blue like my Hadoken. Um, it's a little bit of a bright blue. I'm going to make them glow. I'm actually going to set these to screen so I don't get this stupid black border. Um, there. Nice glowing sparks and parent of the null, you're done. Now if you see any errors like that with the pixel motion, just cut that frame out, because you don't need anyone like that in your life. Now, don't worry about the fact that this looks incredibly cut off. There's going to be so much crap happening right there that nobody's going to notice. Um, another thing I like doing is adding a smoke puff. So I have this powder hit asset from Action Essentials 2, again. I'm um, going to disable these spark layers so you don't need them. Now this is just a sort of, it's called a powder hit, but it looks really like a smoke hit in my opinion. So let me make that screen so it looks realistic. Parent it to the null, follows the shot. So now we've got a bit of environmental effects in here. We've got sparks coming out of it and we've got a big puff of smoke. And remember, puff of smoke is from Action Essentials, you got to make a pixel motion so it follows the same. So there's that. Um, another big step, I think, at this point is the flare and the distortion. We've got our assets, we've got our shockwaves, we've got our flashes, we've got our beam, now the distortion. So make an adjustment layer, put it above your lighting, and um, you're going to want to apply a couple of different distortion effects. I like using Ripple, so does Andrew Kramer. Um, but it just sort of looks good in this sense. I'm going to set this to symmetric, make the radius a little bigger, and then I'm going to set all of these to make it really noticeable so I can see how big the radius of this is. And that looks about good, 18 or 20. I'm going to make the wave height fairly big, make the wave speed like 4. Um, parent the center of ripple to the null. There we go. There we go. So, now we got the center of the null parented. The, no, the distortion parented the center of the null. Um, I think I screwed up with the ripple because it doesn't look very... There we go, that looks a little better. The wave height is a little low, I'm going to increase that to 50. The radius looks like it could be 25. There. That looks fairly good. Um, right at the moment of impact, I also like to add a bulge effect right here. You don't really need to uh, parent anything because it's such a short effect that you can just do it by hand. I'm going to increase the radius of the bulge by dragging these little things fairly largely. I'm going to bring up the taper a little bit to tighten the bulge, make it look more realistic. Keyframe the bulge center for a couple of frames to follow your Hadoken hand. And right, and this sort of effect would com should come on like really quickly and not fade in. So 0.5, I'm going to set it to because that's enough and fade it out over like three frames and make the bulge height zero by keyframing that. So sort of a big as the Hadoken starts. So there's that. What's this? That's my beam. And now I think the final step now is the flare. I think we're almost done here. Um, so turn off the distortion. I'm gonna get my solid. Call it flare. Get optical flares from Video Copilot. And I can't see it for whatever reason. Oh, okay. 
I'm gonna set it to over transparency. Apparently, most people forget to forget. Apparently, most people forget to set the blending mode to screen, according to some guy who does tutorials. But I think, and screen makes it blend better within the scene, in my opinion. I'm gonna set this. Which flare should I use? Um, personally, I think cool flare works pretty well with this kind of effect. Um, and now you're gonna take the position of the null, take the flare, get your position x, y, and parent it to the null. And now you've got a flare that follows your null. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to scale it up to 150, um, keyframe the brightness to come on really quickly. So that like 50, is that? I'll actually set the scale to 60 or so. No, actually, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set the brightness to 125 and the scale to 200 for the first few frames. Fade it out over a couple back to 100 and 150. And one thing I might add is some camera shake. So if I turn all my layers back on, you'll see this effect in its entirety. Now one thing I might do is turn on motion blur for all of these layers so they actually follow the scene with blur, but that's going to increase my rendering time and make this a really slow tutorial. So basically just a, um, go to here, um, turn on motion blur for your, uh, your assets, your shockwave, your flare, your beam, your flashes, just basically everything, then make sure motion blur is enabled in the composition. Now this is gonna about triple my rendering time, so I'm just gonna turn it off for now. Now, I'm the only, normally I would just put turn it on for almost anything, but I just wanna keep this tutorial fast, you know? So, um, what you're gonna do to get camera shake is select all layers by pressing Command or Control A and holding Command Shift C or Control Shift C to pre-compose them. I'm gonna call this Hadoken Precomp. And back in this, what you're gonna do is you're gonna scale this up to 105 or so. 105.5. And go to the position, search for the slider control effect. And this expression control is going to allow you to parent effects to it in terms of, in the form of a slider. So what I'm going to do is have it set an expression on the position, type wiggle 20, comma, and then get the pick whip over to the slider control. So it's basically, and finish it off with another parenthesis and a semicolon. Now doing this is going to say whatever the value of this is, make it make the clip offset by that value 20 times a second so if i increase this to 70 it is offsetting the clip by a value of 70 10 20 times a second now this is kind of a ridiculous amount of camera shake and as you can see the reason i scaled it up was so that wouldn't happen so you couldn't see the edges of the clip that's why i'm only going to do like 40 or so this is still a large amount of camera shake but it helps sell the effect and um, the idea there's like a big Hadoken happening. And one thing I would always do is add motion blur to this clip. Again, this is going to increase your rendering times. But now if you look at your final Hadoken effect, this is what you're going to see. And the last thing you're going to want to do is keyframe the amount to fade in over like two frames or so. So no shake, and then tons of shake. And actually you might want to set another keyframe right here and go back a couple set a big keyframe for something like 60 to like really rock it maybe 55 for the first few frames and then just fade back down to uh 50. <clears throat> so now you can play back your final hadoken so there's what your final effect looks like i made it a little too shaky but the general idea is going to be based on how well you execute these as you know i was just doing this quick for a tutorial so some things aren't perfect, as you can see the um, clip shakiness makes it go out of the, air, the work area for a couple of frames at some points. The, uh, the lens flare, as it moves away from the camera, it doesn't get all that smaller, because I didn't keyframe that at all. Um, you might want to actually add motion blur to these things, because I didn't just to um, keep this tutorial fast. 
but this is a pretty accurate recreation of what I did in the video. Now, um, like I said, you should go check out Andrew Kramer's tutorial on his sci-fi weapon effects, because I borrowed a lot of different things from that tutorial. And, um, like I said before, if you go to the other effect that I did for the clan war, the wide shot where he's actually hadokening a guy, um, you'll see j you won't see a difference in what I did, but you will see like a difference in terms of um, just extra stuff, you know. So if you look here, we've got the guy doing the hadoken. We got a lens flare. We got the same beam effects, distortion, lighting and sparks coming out. Now, this guy over here is getting hit by the Hadouken. I have the um, the end of the beam with a bit of a wiggle expression on it, and um, some sparks flying out, and I was sure to mask those sparks. Where are they? So, they did, did, so the benches obscured them. And um, as you can see, there's some smoke coming out of him. Now, I probably fooled you all with this, because this smoke trail was not big enough to come out of him and be realistic. These are three separate smoke trails. I connected them using cleverly edited editing, and you've all been bamboozled. Now, if you want to know exactly what I did here, um, these are three iterations of the exact same clip. One of them is here with a mask and a lot of feathering. The other one is here, and the other one's down here. Now, each of these ha are offset in different times so that it doesn't look so linear. As you can see here, these two look pretty similar, but with all the other crap that's going on in this effect, it's not all that noticeable, especially since these are all semi-transparent. Um, we've got a glow happening on this whole amphitheater type area, and um, if you're wondering how I did the duplication effect, it's probably one of the simplest effects in the entire world, I must say. Here's one guy. And here's the other. This guy has a mask on him with some feathering to make it blend. That's it. That's the entire thing. To make things easier to do that kind of effect, you just shoot at the same camera angle, so ma so trying to match the footage up will be easier. Also, if you're ever doing that, I suggest doing it on a tripod. And ha if you want it to look handheld, add in the handheld motion later with like a position expression or something like that. Because it's going to be really hard to copy yourself with a handheld shot. If any people that you're copying obscure each other, you're going to have to do some rotoscoping. And as you know, that's fun. So that's essentially what happens in here. And if you want to know how to do a muzzle flash, um, go to Freddy W's channel, I guess, because he knows, he knows it better than I do. And that's essentially it. If I missed something or crossed over a detail or I didn't recreate this effect completely, um, and just leave a comment about it, and I'll try to answer your questions. And I'm going to be releasing a breakdown of the eye laser VFX soon, so stay tuned for that. Bye.